All right. So we're going to be going over a little bit more of a technical interview question. A lot of the times in solution architect or solution engineering uh, interview loops, you'll be assigned with a technical assessment. And usually they'll give this to you as a take home kind of homework assignment where you go ahead and answer the question and then present that to either the hiring manager, someone on the team, or even sometimes a panel of people. So the question that uh, Polkit and I will be going over today is, if you want a website to be accessed by selected users, what steps, what steps would you take? Uh, just one small thing which I need to mention before we get started is that all the um, content that I present is my own and not uh, Salesforce. So uh, Salesforce is not associated with this content in any shape or form. Uh, Mohammed, do you mind if I just share my screen real quick to show you a diagram? Maybe yeah. you can make it a little bit more visual so that it is understandable. For sure. Right. So the question was, if you want a website to be accessed by only selected users, what steps are you going to take? And I would say the first and the most common step that uh, no, um, normally is taken by websites is to enable IP whitelisting. Now, IP whitelisting is basically a way of saying that, hey, um, only people from the, these particular IPs or a particular IP range can actually access my website, right? So for example, let's suppose that you have a company's um, server and that company only wants to um, give the access to that particular system to specific employees or specific teams. So if you see in this diagram, this is the company's um, server, which is on GCP Google Cloud, right? And it is hosted in two regions, US and Asia. Now the company says, hey, I want only this particular employee in San Francisco and this particular employee in Singapore who access my systems, but no other employees must do that. So basically what they do is they create a rule um, on the component that is uh, accessing the GCP backend systems, which is basically a load uh, balancer. And this load balancer basically checks the IP of whatever employee is trying to access this uh, system, right? And if that particular employee's IP is in the um, IP whitelisting, then it kind of forwards this request to, you know, the service that they're trying to access. Otherwise, they do block the request. For example, if somebody in um, New York with the IP of 198.51.100.1 tries, uh, tries to access this, and this IP is not present in this list here, then the request is going to be blocked. But this is just a small example, right? Because IP whitelisting is also used in systems. For example, if a system like Salesforce is trying to access another enterprise system like SAP, IP whitelisting is also used very commonly there. Um, so for example, in SAP, uh, whenever a request enters SAP, then you uh, definitely have a way to say, hey, I only want requests from this particular IP ranges to be to be accepted by SAP and Salesforce is probably, you know, one of the systems in that IP ranges. So this is how typically it is done. Um, so this is the most common way. Uh, one other way which you can actually do it is mutual TLS. And normally what you see in enterprises especially is that, that in enterprises, um, they use typically a combination of IP whitelisting plus mutual TLS to keep their uh, system safe. So before we go on to mutual TLS, let's uh, kind of talk about what does TLS mean. So TLS is basically that, you know, when um, a browser, for example, is accessing a particular website, then the browser checks, hey, is the website being accessed valid or not? And that is typically done using this padlock icon for example, if you go here, you can basically just check um, which certificate is this. So if you see, I'm accessing the Google Drive right now. So this certificate basically confirms that the website I'm accessing is actually google.com and nobody's trying to, you know, uh, tell us that they are a website which they, they are not. So like we discussed, uh, the first step in a normal TLS uh, interaction is that the client, which is the browser in this case, he or she is trying to, or you know, it 
is trying to connect to the server, which is, a, which is actually Google's server, right? The server, which is Google, it sends a certificate to the client. The client checks whether the certificate is valid or not. And then if it is valid, communication is established between the client, which is the browser, Chrome in this case, and the Google server. So this is normal TLS, where only the server needs to identify and verify itself before the client can establish communication. Now you also have mutual TLS, where both the client and the server has to establish that they are who they say before um, communication can be established. So for example, here we have a few steps. For example, client, let's say Salesforce in this case, is trying to access another server, which is for example from SAP. So Salesforce connects to SAP, right? And SAP gives its uh, TLS uh, certificate to Salesforce. Salesforce checks whether the certificate is valid or not. And in exchange, Salesforce now also has to present its um, certificate to SAP. And SAP is also going to check whether the certificate presented by Salesforce is valid or not. And once both certificates have been validated only then communication can be um, established so these are the usual ways by which you can uh, by which a website can actually um, be accessed by only selected users or selected systems awesome okay i think you did a really good job at explaining uh you know the the different ways with both white uh, IP whitelisting as well as mutual TLS and regular TLS. When you're going through this process, um, you know, a lot of the times, you know, the hiring manager will ask um, kind of your your process. How did you go about, you know, um, you know, learning the information and 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 whatnot? Like what what, what kind of steps did you did you take um, you know, in in learning, gathering the information? Uh, creating these diagrams and all of that. Um, is it previous knowledge that you've gotten through college, your previous jobs? Did you have to do any additional research? How did, how did that go for you? I think a lot of this knowledge comes from just experience of designing and developing enterprise systems across, uh, you know, the various companies that I've worked with. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, you know, there are several courses that you can go through uh, to, you know, get this uh, knowledge. Uh, because um, if you are starting your career as a developer, typically you, you will not do stuff like this because right. IP whitelisting and, you know, for example, all the security stuff is being taken care of by a separate security team. But I think mm -hmm. the, these concepts are really important if you, you know, want to gain a basic uh, knowledge of how the entire, let's say, um, architecture in a particular system works. So that's why yeah. important. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, for the viewers who are watching at home, um, you know, you might be wondering, let's say you're, you know, going into your first solution architect, solution engineer role, you might be seeing this and wondering like, oh, I'm not going for a security related, you know, SA or SE role. Like, will I actually be asked questions about this while I'm in, you know, my interview uh, or well, while I'm in the job and whatnot? And you know, you'll be surprised. Customers, customers do want to, you know, have an understanding at some level, right, uh, about how your company will, you know, allow whitelisting and 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 whatnot. Um, you know, that was something that was pretty common for me at Salesforce. Book that, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably the same for you. But customers, you know, do ask these sorts of questions, right? Um, and you know, it's your job as the SA to either answer that question for them or point them in the right direction. Um, in, in how your company handles security and whatnot. So even if you're not going for a security related SA rule, it still is really important to understand how this all works on a high level. And again, the way that Poolkit was able to, you know, demonstrate this um, through the diagram and then explain it, um, I think was, you know, really good example of, of how you would actually, you know, in a real life customer call, um, you know, present this to a customer. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there, is there anything that you would have, uh, you would have done differently in, in presenting this information or, um, if not, that's totally fine too. Cause I think this is a pretty, pretty great, you know, diagram and, and whatnot, but is there anything that you would have done differently? I think the most important thing is to 
kind of judge, you know, how your audience is expecting the information to be presented and also how deep do you want to go into this, right? Uh, yeah. So if if you are, you know, for example, talk to a hiring manager that is kind of judging your technical depth on these things, then for sure, you know, it is possible to go very, very deep into networking, how IPs work, how, you know, the various mm -hmm. protocols work like TCP, IP and UDP and so on. But if you are kind of, let's say, um, trying to present this in a panel um, interview sort of uh, situation where it is not important to go deep, but it is important to actually very clearly explain these uh, concepts, um, then, you know, I would say that you stay uh, high level, uh, mm -hmm. talk with uh, diagrams. That is one of the most um, uh, important thing and go deep only when you are being asked to go deep. So don't go into unnecessary depth if it does not help you ace your um, conversation. For sure, for sure. I think that's, that's uh, yeah, I think I think that's a good response to that. Um, is it, Pokit, any any other last, uh, you know, last remarks or, or anything about, about the question and your advice to those watching at home? Um, so I would say that I completely agree with what you said about, you know, uh, exploring new areas and not just the one that, you know, you are going to become a future SA in uh, because SA is one of the profile where you are kind of expected to have uh, what we call a T-shaped career, right? So you could have depth in vert one particular side of things, for example, networking or, you know, mm -hmm. um, cloud or AWS or, you know, uh, a particular SaaS um, application or, for example, a data platform like Snowflake, Databricks, and so on. But it is really, really important to also work on the overall um, architecture, including, you know, everything that a customer might potentially ask you. Sure. And that is, in my opinion, you know, what makes a really good um, essay. So yeah. I completely agree with what you said about developing skills that are not just related to the work that you're doing, day to day, but also what your customers uh, have their challenges with. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Always, you know, level up your skill set, and that I, I would say maybe even applies to other roles within tech, right? Like even if you're hired for one position, you know, in one specific niche and whatnot, it's still really good to have, you know, um, kind of a more holistic understanding of, you know, how the industry works and whatnot, right? Because you know, you might be focused on one part, um, you know, of of a technology um, in your career at one point in time, and then you know maybe maybe that gets outdated, right? So, and you need to go ahead and jump to like you know the next new hot thing, right? So it's always good to make sure that your your tech skills are always up to date and whatnot. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Polkin, for uh, coming in and answering this question. Um, for those of you who are watching at home, thank you for watching. If you like this video, please make sure to give it a like, share it with anyone who you think. Uh, we'll find this to be useful um, and comment below any, uh, what, you know, what you want to see next uh, from the Solution Architect mock interview series. Um, but yeah, with that, have a good one. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to let us know that this video is valuable for you. And of course, check out hundreds more videos just like this at tryexponent.com. Thanks for watching and good luck on your upcoming interview.